following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! Go Cowboys! This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Your war room for insider news and draft analysis from deep within the confines of Cowboys headquarters at the Star in Frisco. The Dallas Cowboys are like Michael And now, your hosts... Brian Broaddus, Jeff Cavanaugh, Kyle Yeomans, and David Hellman. Somebody is always going to think you're trash. Wise words from Liberty quarterback Malik Willis. That is that is what is on my mind here. Day two of the NFL Combine. Day two of the draft show. Welcome in, everybody. I am Dave Hellman, your host. I am joined once again by Kyle Yeomans and the incomparable Dane Brugler from The Athletic. Hmm. Fellas. You're not trash, Dave. Somebody just, thinks I am, though. Maybe, That's the beauty of it somewhere. <laughs> There's maybe, always maybe. somebody out there. No one at this table thinks that. I appreciate no, that. I agree with that. Somebody I, at home listening to this is like, you know what, Dave? You're right. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. And that Laquan Treadwell take he had. Oh, oh man. Uh, we don't have to jump right in. Yeah, on don't look at my Laquan it. Treadwell takes. <laughs> don't don't look at that. But yeah. See, I, but nobody thinks about Dane that way. There's no way. Yeah. Oh, You're there's right. there's somebody. Is there somebody? Yes. Yes. There's plenty for me. I know that. But somebody yeah. back at Mount Union is just like <laughs> that Brugler guy. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Mm. We won't name names, but yeah, they, they exist. That got way off the rails way faster than I meant to. <laughs> but so two two thoughts. All right, we're we're once again here. I mean, you don't need me to set the stage, but I will. We're at the Indianapolis Convention Center again. The combine is slowly but surely sort of cranking into life. That's the frustration of this is like as the combine has become a bigger and bigger deal, they've actually pushed the workouts into the weekend. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we're here just we're just desperate to see some sort Anything. of on field activity. Yep. Um, in lieu of that, we did we did start to talk to prospects today. The wide receivers talked to the media. The quarterbacks talked to the media. Malik Willis with my favorite quote of the year to this point. I think it's very wise from a guy that is going to have his game picked apart for the next three months until he's finally drafted. I guess two months at this point. Um, but, yeah, so as we sort of sit here and wait for more action to develop, what do you make of, of what we saw today? And, and we can start with the quarterbacks if y'all want to. Again, the most enigmatic class I can remember in a long time. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know that there was anything groundbreaking from these quarterbacks today. Um, you know, Kenny Pickett from Pitt, unsurprisingly, was the most polished, I thought, uh, in terms of the interviews and commanding the room and that type of thing. Um, you know, fifth-year senior, he's been around. He, he knows the drill very comfortable with everything um but and that's not to say these other quarterbacks weren't uh, i thought they handled themselves well uh you know i give carson strong a lot of credit for being as upfront as he is about the knee um things like that you know he doesn't hide from it um and that's something that i respect him for that now that that could end up affecting where he's drafted but um you know i, I give him credit for being you know very open about it um you know, Desmond Ritter, uh, all these quarterbacks. I thought they did well. I mean, nothing really stood out to me. Anything for you? I, I, I'm kind of along the same lines. Carson Strong, in the way that the knee has kind of been a red flag on him throughout this draft process, he's one of those guys, depending on who you talk to, is one of those mid-range quarterbacks that could take a jump, whether or not he's, he's healthy and what the medicals end up showing throughout the week here in Indianapolis. And like you said, he was up front. He said it. He said, my knee's not going to fall off. I'm good to go i've been cleared i'm gonna do all the testing i'm gonna go through all of this uh throughout the week in order to show that i am good to go he played without a brace in mobile during the senior right. bowl he thought that was a big step moving into uh what is now the draft process and he feels like he's put it out there and it's funny you, you mentioned the malik willis quote about everybody thinks you're trash he had another one that i thought was really funny somebody as well. thinks you're trash. somebody not sorry everybody. not everybody you're right i'm i'm speaking from my own terms gonna fall in love with that young man mm -hmm. I, I, I i'm starting like to lot. yeah i, I think he's a great to. guy and I, I have a past relationship just from the play-by-play -play side of things with malik and and i i've liked him from a couple years ago at that point and uh he said another thing uh, later on somebody asked him if he's the top quarterback in the draft and he goes i certainly think i'm the top quarterback in the draft but 
I'm not the guys making the decisions, and I hate that for me. <laughs> he was he was very upfront. He's like, I hate that for myself. The fact that I'm not the one making the decisions, but I think it's a, a very heady quarterback class, and you saw that today with the media interviews. There's a lot of smarts, a lot of football IQ amongst this class. It's do the the on field traits match the the IQ. I think you're going to have a lot of smart guys in the class, but maybe they're just not the athletic freak shows that you've seen in maybe some of the classes of of old. Dane, you're a perfect person to ask about this because I think something that jumped out to me, Kenny Pickett talked about talking to Peyton Manning Mm -hmm. about going back to school. Obviously paid off tremendously for him. ACC Player of the Year, Heisman candidate, and played his way into the first round of the draft. Yeah. I'll be very honest. I don't remember that really even being a conversation. Like, ironically, reminds me of Joe Burrow a little bit because yeah, it that's g- fair. go back to 2018, we were thinking about Joe as like maybe like a third round pick or worse mm-hmm. and played his way to number one overall. What was your opinion of Kenny Pickett before he came back for 2021? I, I liked him quite a bit. I had a. Uh, I'm- Relatively speaking, uh, I thought he was, you know, fourth, fifth round. I thought he was a uh, guy that's going to be a career backup in the league. So I did like him. Um, but to see this type of improvement for him as a senior, and, and I, I talked, I spent some time with his offensive coordinator, Mark Whipple, um, uh, during the season to get a better sense for, okay, what what changed? You know, what's different about Kenny Pickett this year? And Mark Whipple, who who's spent some time in the NFL um, as a quarterback coach, so he's got some interesting experience there. Uh, he basically just boiled it down to that you can't put a, a, any type of timeline on terms of experience. Like just having that extra year gave just things started to click for him in terms of seeing things quicker, uh, understanding what the defense is trying to do. Um, I thought the offensive line played much better for Pitt this year, so he has a little bit extra time to operate from the pocket. Um, I, I think you, you brought up Joe Burrow and the difference that he made from his junior year to his senior year. Kenny Pickett, it's not as drastic, but similar in terms of the improvements that he made. You just can't put a price on on experience and what that means, especially for a quarterback, because the more you see, the quicker you can eliminate things, the quicker you understand what where you need to go with the football. And I think with Kenny Pickett, things really clicked for him. Now, what's his ceiling as a player? Uh, that's the big question. Um, I think he has the, clearly the highest floor of any draft uh, or any quarterback in this draft. But is he the type of guy that can lead you to the playoffs? Is he the type of guy that can lead you to, you know, and beyond, Super Bowl? I don't know. And I I just find it very hard to have any conviction in any of these quarterbacks this year in terms of them ever becoming a top 15 quarterback in the NFL. And and if you're going to draft a quarterback in the first round, you better believe that, you know, at some point during his rookie contract, he will become a top 15 quarterback in the NFL. And I just don't know how you could have any confidence in these guys and say that. And so if I'm the Cowboys, I'm feeling pretty darn good that I've got Dak Prescott as my quarterback. <laughs> this is not the, the not it, the off season to need a quarterback. It really is. It's a, it's a blessing in disguise. We were talking to to some of the reporters around the the league earlier about that as well. It's like, "Oh, this is this is nice. We're getting to listen to the quarterbacks, but we don't necessarily have to scout these quarterbacks as much as we would on a normal occasion." It's been that way, of course, for quite some time, but a lot of people would look at at Kenny Pickett and of course he's benefiting from a weaker quarterback class Mm -hmm. but I'm looking at my list from last year I had him as a top 10 quarterback before I knew he was going to go back to college so he's always been at the top of that list I'm sure it's probably been that way you said you liked him before Mm -hmm. he elected to return as well so he has some of those traits that a starting quarterback in the NFL could certainly have it goes back to what I was saying earlier. He's a smart player. He has the confidence. He has the experience. Does he have the physical traits to match with all of that that can allow him to have the top 15 caliber career by the time he's done with the rookie deal? Because I agree with Dane wholeheartedly. I don't see a quarterback in this draft, maybe with the exception, and if there's two exceptions, it would be Pickett, it would probably be Malik Willis that can maybe be in that conversation, I would but either throw one Corral of those in there probably. Sure, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, I would throw him fair. maybe on the edge there. I like Willis and Pickett better okay. in my opinion, but I would still throw at least I'll, I'll, just to, to say because he's my third. I'll throw throw three quarterbacks in there, and even then, I still think they're borderline top fifteen at best. So it, it does provide for an interesting thought process with a premium position being so low throughout the entire draft class. That is absolutely terrifying when you think about it, because like the nature of the position, two or three of these guys will get drafted in the first round, yeah. right? Got 100%. to. And yeah. you're telling me that you have no confidence that any of them 
can be an upper echelon starting quarterback. Yeah, that, and that's me. You know what? I'm I'm not the quarterback and, and, and whisperer. I, sure, but, of course. But but just but I think uh, most people agree who, with you. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I think it speaks to you know all the different uh, you know, ice cream flavors. You know, it, it's you're gonna teams are gonna look at these quarterbacks differently and what they offer. One team will look at uh, a Kenny Pickett and say you know what, he's going to help us compete. He's going to help us compete for eight, nine, ten wins every single year, and we'll take that compared to what we have right now. While another team will look at that and say, I don't know that's quite good enough for us. You know, you look at a team like the Steelers who have had a Hall of Fame caliber quarterback for how many years now. Is Kenny Pickett good enough for what they would want to upgrade the quarterback position, or do they think Pickett is good enough? So each each team that needs a quarterback is going to look at this class differently. Not everyone's going to be on on board with waiting for Malik Willis because Malik Willis really shouldn't see the NFL field as a rookie. Yeah. He's just not ready. It, it, or and teams going to be ready to uh, let them sit and wait. A lot of teams won't be that patient. Other teams might be. So it's teams are going to look at these quarterbacks differently and have wildly different opinions, just like a lot of us do. Do you have a class in the past that you could compare this quarterback group to? That that where it's kind of that same sort of mentality. Yeah, I mean was? the the worst quarterback class that I've ever covered uh, was 2013. Okay, that was the EJ Manuel. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. He, you know, he's a first-round bust, but it's not his fault. He shouldn't have been taken in the first round to begin with. Mm -hmm. But that's Matt Barkley, uh, Ryan Nassib, Geno Smith. I mean, those are like you know the top quarterbacks that year. So this quarterback class is better than that. Uh, it's a step up from that. But man, does it look like a huge step down compared to what we saw last year yeah. with five quarterbacks in the top 15. Uh, you know, a guy like Trevor Lawrence and everything he offers. Uh, you know, Zach Wilson and Justin Fields and Trey Lance. And so, yeah, it's just a, it's a t tough quarterback class to really get excited about. But you know what? Quarterback desperation is a real thing throughout this league. And that's why I th I'm putting the over under at 10 when we see the first quarterback drafted. Yeah, which I, and that's, you know, <laughs> you can you can roll your eyes up all all you want about it. If you're a Cowboy fan, I'm still fascinated by this quarterback conversation because I'm obsessed with pushing players down the board. Yeah, you, you want go. as many sure. as you can. And so, OK, so you put it at 10, like yeah. over under 10. Mm -hmm. And I, we did this exercise on a show a few weeks ago where I basically I forced the guys to give me their players that they feel like are locks to go before the Cowboys pick. Like, okay. don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And I think we we came up with two, I think. We we didn't that, name the quarterbacks. Right. Two, wow. Okay. Well, yeah. that, that's the number we came up with, wasn't it? Who, with who two was players? It? Two, no, two quarterbacks. Oh, yes, Sorry. yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, I, think, I think the final list. I thought list, you were saying players. I, thought, no. I was like, there's probably 10 names we put out there. I think there. the final list of players was 12, if okay, I remember correctly. But, it was but two, I think it was 10 with two quarterbacks is the point. And so... How do you feel about that? And if you had to guess, can you, and I know you can't, but I'm asking you anyway, <laughs> can you envision landing spots for some of these guys, and if so, how many? Yeah, I, I think that uh, why I put the over-under at 10 is because I think when you look at uh, the, the teams picking the first nine picks, you've got Carolina at six, Denver at nine. Two possible spots for a quarterback. And then Washington at 11. Washington's been... You know, trying to figure out the quarterback position for a lot of years now. What do they feel good enough about one of these quarterbacks to go that direction um, at 11? Maybe I think that's maybe the most likely spot where we see a quarterback off the board. But um, I, I think there's a good chance we only see one quarterback in the top 23 picks. I really do. I don't. I don't know that. You know, maybe we do. You know, the Steelers. Uh, obviously, that's the direction they could go if they love one of these uh, one of these quarterbacks. But um, so let's just, okay, let's plan it out. We've got, um, let's just say the first quarterback comes off the board at 11. Okay. okay. That's, that's Washington. Yep. Uh, let's say they go Kenny Pickett. Let's say they go the high floor. They figure he's an upgrade over what we have right now. You know, we'll, we'll roll the dice on that. Uh, and let's say the next quarterback, Steelers. Malik Willis, because uh, I, I don't, I don't know that it, you know, the, the Saints are an in, interesting spot with you know new coaching staff. Uh, yeah. You know what, Jameis Winston's a free agent. What, what direction do they go with a with really really a brand new you know kind of face to that that what they are as an identity as a team? Are they really going to throw a first round pick at a at a quarterback this year? It's possible, but I don't know that they will. 
Pittsburgh's interesting. I don't think Philadelphia goes quarterback. Um, so New Orleans or, or, the, or the Steelers look like the next likely bet for a quarterback, and let's say it's Malik Willis. Um, so I, I, I guess saying two quarterbacks off the board in the first 23 picks, I think that's a fair uh, projection at this point. That still doesn't make me feel any better. That makes me feel like 11 is most likely, and even yeah. that's not a lock sure, no. for it to be a quarterback. And then I, I was thinking the same thing. New Orleans, it depends on whether or not they want Jameis Winston back in that, that locker room. Because I don't think they would go back through the Taysom Hill experiment again. I think with Sean they Payton might. Not, with Sean Payton not there, I think that. I think yeah. we can. That's I probably think we can call over, it. Right? I think right. we can call that a day. Yeah. I agree, and, and so that's probably just as likely as Pittsburgh. But either one, neither one of those are really intriguing to pick before twenty three. See, I disagree. Just be like, you know how every like, you know how you like kind of fall in love with an idea. During are you a draft? falling in love with an idea? I I I love the idea of Pittsburgh taking a quarterback, mm-hmm. and preferably Willis for me. Dane just said probably shouldn't play. The Steelers have the foundation to where he doesn't need to play. I'm not saying Mason Rudolph is good, and Dwayne Haskins certainly not for that matter, but, like, they have guys in-house that can handle it. They can take snaps. They've got a nasty defense. Like, they got to the playoffs this year with – Ben Roethlisberger just shot putting the ball. They took a running back at 24 last year, so right. I think they the bigger, have the opportunity. The, the bigger question might be, do they have to move up to, to get their quarterback? Interesting. Or, or do they stay put at 20 and, you know, say, yeah, we feel good our guy will be there. Or do they risk that? Do they feel like they need to go up and get him? Um, you know, we've seen the Steelers. When they really want a player, they will go up and get him. With Troy Polamalu, Devin, Devin Bush. Bush yeah. We've seen them do it before. So, uh, that to me, that might be the bigger question with uh, the Steelers and their quarterback target in this draft. They don't have a ton of draft capital. They've got a first, second, third, and a fourth comp. And then they don't pick again until the seventh. Mm. So, if they're going to do it, they're going to have to use their future and wage their future against it. Yeah, and, and I think it's also worth noting that I don't know that it's going to cost as much this year to trade up because teams are going to be so Ooh, willing to get point. out of there. You know, like yeah. if if all you're offering is, um, you know, so like when the when the Steelers moved up to get Devin Bush, I think they only gave up a second round pick. I think that's all it took is you know obviously they swapped first rounds and then an extra an extra two. In this year's draft, to move up seven eight spots, it might only take a third uh, to get to do it when. In in past drafts, to go up and get a quarterback, it takes a, a lot. But in this draft, where teams are going to be more willing to get out of there, pick up, because we know the the strength of this draft is second, third round, even in the fourth round, where you're going to get quality depth. You might be okay with moving back seven, eight spots in the first round, still feel like you're going to get a good player and who you want while picking up a third-round pick. I like that idea. Well, let me ask you this. And anytime you pick in the back half, you're always going to get questions about trading up. Just mm-hmm. people are always going to do, and and that's fine. I get it. It's intriguing. Do you think? Do you think a, a team like the Cowboys would be more likely to trade up because it could be cheaper this year, or more likely to not do that because you look at it and say, well, who are we going up for? I mean, like, yeah. uh, if you're, I think up that's in this, an interesting conversation. It, it is no no question. If you're trading up in this draft, you better love that person. I mean, you better be scared out of your wits that he's not going to make it to you and have that type of conviction about him. Um, and is there a, that type of player like that in this draft? And I, the Cowboys in this draft, it's so fascinating because we'll see what happens the next you know month with wide receiver. You know, what happens at tight end? What happens at several of these key positions that we know are potential needs on this roster that hopefully we have a better idea a month, month and a half of what how they have planned to attack that position moving forward. Um, you know, because if one of these receivers that they just fall in love with uh, and they see a guy that, hey, th- could be the difference maker, <laughs> go get him. Dave's got the twinkle in his well, eye. No, I mean, hey, Dane already brought up my failed love affair with a big-bodied SEC West receiver. receiver. Go I'm just, get Traylon Burks. Look, Ooh. I already was developing a draft crush on Traylon Burks, but when I found out that he hunts boars with a knife, <laughs> yep. if you didn't, uh, t- Kyle, you told me, so tell yep. tell the listeners. Yeah, he doesn't just hunt boars or hogs. He uh, he goes and knife hunts them. So, and he said, it's go, go look at the interview. It's online. It's somewhere. He, he doesn't shoot them from afar. He, like, Hand-to-hand tries to. Hand-to-hand combat. Yeah, yeah, he, like, tries to, to, to deceive it. 
and then sneak up on it and just put it in a chokehold ultimately. And and I mean, it's pretty yeah, he, pretty primal. It's he he grew up in terrifying. You know, just central Arkansas. <laughs> just that's that that's what they did. They, you know, hunting that's what, was a that's big what part they of they it. I think normal the, I think the Jones family is big into boar hunting. There so you go. I like. Hey, I mean, it's maybe a it's a connection. Fit. And for all the Next. for all of the you know people love to make a big deal about the Jones family going to Arkansas. Like Felix right. Jones is the only big it. pick they've ever mm -hmm. spent on that program. Yep. I'm just saying. Which, as long as we're doing this, we'll go to break in a minute because we do have a lot of Twitter questions to get to. But he's your wide receiver too. Yes. What yes. what makes him so? Uh, I I think when you talk about six two and a half six three two hundred twenty five pounds, um, guys that are that size and move like that because he's gonna run. High four fours, low four fives. Um, the SEC is a pretty good conference, right? I've heard that. It's yes. decent. Nobody in the SEC had more explosive plays, more plays of 20 plus yards than him uh, last year, 2021. So he is a big play igniter. He's got the speed to run away from guys. He can separate down the field. Not the most refined receiver, but uh, you know, just get him the ball, get the ball in his hands, and let him let him do stuff. Uh, physically, he's impressive. I, I've been calling him a before the Debo Samuels comps became like all the rage over the last everybody's the other Debo know, in the NFL right now. In October, I was calling this guy the linebacker size Debo Samuel, um, and so I, that, I think that's what he is. You just find ways to get him the ball. And this morning during his interview, he said that he mimics. He used the word mimic, mimics his game after Debo Samuel. Um, so that physicality, that toughness, uh, the play strength, uh, I, I think he brings a lot of that. Plus. He's a blazer. He can run really yeah. fast at 6'3", 225, 228. So uh, the, the, if I'm in, in a war room and I need to sell Traylon Burks to the rest of the room, it's not going to be hard. <laughs> it's not going to be <laughs> I was going to say, if you have to sell it, kind I assume me nobody there. else yeah. is watching tape would be my guess. Right. Yeah. All right. I think we did a pretty good job considering still nothing has happened at the NFL Combine. Now so I want to trade up and get in front of Philadelphia and go get Tyler Linderbaum. Dane talked me into it. I'm, miss, I'm Captain Trade Up now. You oh. want to trade up? So Linder, I want to trade Linderbaum's up. your guy that you want to Linderbaum's go get? Linderbaum's huh? the guy I want to go get. Okay. Get me in front of Philadelphia. Let's let's make a deal with the Browns at 13. Let's figure it out. I've got Cleveland across the table. I'm going to make a call. I haven't. All right. Well, now we'll we'll save that. I'm we can sorry. do this. I just, no, I we can do this. We'll, we can do this in the third segment. That's what happens? Until then, we've got Twitter <laughs> questions. We will do that right after the break. We'll be right back. At Smoothie King, we are blending goodness to fuel your greatness. Every blend is crafted to help you achieve your health and fitness goals. Smoothie King uses only whole fruits and organic veggies. You'll never find sugary syrups or artificial flavors, colors, or preservatives. And unlike some other smoothie places, there are zero grams of added sugar in many of our blends. Smoothie King is proud to be the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. Place your order in the app or online for pickup or delivery. Smoothie King, rule the day. What do you call a group of grown men and women with their faces painted silver and blue who get together every week to share a three-hour-long ritual of jumping, sinking, and toasting Miller Lite and 10-gallon hats while yelling, how about them cowboys? You call it Miller Time in Dallas. Here's to the cowboys. Here's to the original light beer. It's Miller Time. Celebrate responsibly. 2021 Miller Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. Football season is almost over, and that means tax season is here. With it comes Taxiety. Filing taxes can be stressful if you choose the wrong partner. Don't let Taxiety take over this tax season. Liberty Tax will help you get your largest possible refund or your money back. With more than 12,000 tax professionals nationwide, help is always around the corner. Check out Liberty Tax, proud partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Schedule an appointment today at libertytax.com slash cowboys. Liberty Tax, a brighter way to do taxes. Hey, Cowboys. Cowboys fans, if you're thinking about attending a game this season, visit CowboysTravel.com to book your travel package today. Stay at the team hotel, have dinner with a Cowboys legend, and experience AT&T Stadium's exclusive VIP Owners Club. Also, tour the star, get autographs from your favorite players, and talk X's and O's with me, Mickey Spagnola. The official travel partner of the Dallas Cowboys will take care of all your travel needs. Visit CowboysTravel.com. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Welcome back to the Draft Show. It is Wednesday, March the 2nd. It is the second segment of the show. You know what that means. We'd like to get our listeners involved. Twitter on the 20. 
Twitter, Twitter, Twitter on the 20, 20, 20. You do, you do a pretty good job with that. I just kind of follow Kyle. Jeff's lead, honestly. That's what I try and do. So talking about the depth of the draft, Dane, you, you said this in the first segment, second, third, maybe even fourth round. And you, you did. You talked about the depth of the pass rusher position yesterday. If that's if that's where you want to go with this, we can. But Troy would like to know about a position or positions in this draft where you feel like you can get a better than expected player on day three, like maybe fourth round. Honestly, I think of uh, like Jabril Cox comes to mind, a guy that we absolutely didn't right. expect to be there on day three. Any positions with depth like that where? We're sitting there like, oh, my God, like four of my five top names on Saturday are are still available, and I didn't think they would be. I think it starts with pass rusher. I mean, that's that's the deepest position this year, and so there's a good chance that a player you grade as a top 100 pick in this draft is still there in the fourth round because there's just there's only so many spots for these guys, and a few of them will get pushed down. Uh, a guy like Josh Paschal from Kentucky, 6'3", 270, really good run defender. All day in most drafts, he's a third-round pick in this draft. Might be a fourth round pick. Uh, I think linebacker shapes up that way. You mentioned Jabril Cox. I mean, it could be a similar thing this year where uh, a linebacker like, uh, say, Troy Anderson from Montana State, you know, maybe he falls to the fourth round. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a raw player, but I, when you look at the athletic traits and what he's going to grow into, get you excited about what he could be. I have heard his name a ton. Yeah, yeah he, and he's. First of all, the backstory is great. I mean, he growing up in Montana, um, he he was class valedictorian, won a state title in three different sports. You know, the do everything guy in high school goes to Montana State, started at quarterback, started at running back. Uh, he's he ranks top ten in the school's all time history in rushing yards. <laughs> <laughs> Moves to linebacker. He set the school record for single season rushing touchdowns as a sophomore, twenty one. Moves a linebacker and becomes a full time linebacker for just really the past two years. Uh, or for, he missed last year with, a, with an injury, so but he has two years of experience as a full-time linebacker, and you know they just don't make many guys that are six three and a half, two fifty that run like he he does. And I thought he got better and better with the more defensive snaps he saw. So uh, I, I, another guy that's raw, and I'm not sure he's an instant contributor for you, but again, an investment where you feel like you're buying low and getting a guy that's gonna uh, blossom for you throughout your time in your program. Uh, I mean, coaches love those 6'3", 6'4", guys, 230 pounds sure. because they can translate it, whether it's on offense or defense. That just sounds like a special teams ace. I mean, sure. Troy yep. Anderson, if he's not contributing as a starting linebacker at some point in his career, he may be your best special teams player throughout his career at the same time. Maybe C.J. Goodwin, stuff like that. I, I was curious. I want to hear about the safety position because I see that mm. as one of those where – there's going to be some really good players. Sterling Weatherford's up there for me. Cam Taylor Britt, Kirby Joseph, Leon O'Neal Jr. from A&M. These are guys that I think could potentially fall into that third, fourth, fifth round that, I, once again, it's a deep class. Maybe it's got those those top-heavy guys like Kyle Hamilton, Dax Hill, sure. and company. But there's that gap, and then you can find some real value later on as well. Yeah, I think that that's fair. I think there are six safeties at the top that are kind of the top guys. Who are your six? Kyle Hamilton's at the top. Okay. Dax Hill's right behind him. I think mm-hmm. those two are the top guys. Um, Petrie, uh, Lewis Seen from Georgia, Brisker, Brian Cook. Okay. Th- that, that next tier would be those four guys. And then, you know, I really like Kirby Joseph as a possible third rounder. Um, Nick, keep the name Nick Cross uh, from Maryland uh, on the radar. He's going to absolutely kill it this week at the combine those testing numbers uh teams are going to really buy into those nick cross is going to be a winner from this week and be a guy that you know we're, we're talk to, talking more and more about as a possible third round keep pick. your eye on the athletic on monday morning <laughs> for that. Exactly. Be a winner. Yeah, no uh, <laughs> jt woods from baylor um okay. you know i, I, I like mentioned, him a lot I mentioned yesterday how baylor brought a track team here he's one of those guys i mean he's maybe a little undersized compared to what most safeties are uh, just body type wise uh, a little slender, but he could absolutely fly, and he makes plays. Um, Verone McKinley from Oregon, a local kid from uh, mm-hmm. Carrollton, uh, played at Hebron. Uh, you know, he's a guy that's going to get dinged because he's not fast and he's not big. But I think when you when you look at the his cover awareness, you look at the way he can make plays on the ball. I mean, it's six picks this year, so he can find the ball. Um, but he's going to take a little bit of a hit because he doesn't have those elite physical traits. I don't think he's going to run this week because probably not going to run great. Yeah. So uh, you know, Verone McKinley would be one of those guys once we get out of day 
one and two in early day three, maybe a guy you take a look at. Speaking of day three selections, I like this question from Amit a lot. Uh, he would like you to compare Josh Ball, Cowboys fourth mm -hmm. round pick, red shirt, mm -hmm. really didn't see much of him this year. So still not sure what you have, but how would he compare in this tackle class? You know, I, I think that obviously with him, there's, you know, uh, off field factor sure. in and all yeah, sure. that. So, you know, taking all that out of a not into account here. Um, you know, this is a tackle class that I think it's one of the stronger positions. I think, you know, edge rushers at the top and mm -hmm. then I think receiver, linebacker, tackle might be my next three. So it's a it's a pretty deep tackle group. Um, I, I think he'd be somewhere after you list your top 10 tackles and then he could be somewhere right after that. So in that 11 to 15 range in terms of the top tackles this year, um, I, I think that he has a t so much ability with the way he moves. Uh, that I, I think that's what you bet on. You, you bet on those movement skills that, uh, you know, he can mirror in space. He can he can hold up versus speed, but also, uh, you know, drop his anchor when he needs to versus power. Um, so, I, I'm, you know, we don't know what, 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 what we have with him. So, I, I think that, you know, hopefully that there's more clarity uh, moving forward. But, you know, I liked him as a player uh, last year in last year's class. I'm trying to look at where I had him last year in that class, but, I would probably put him around. I like Braxton Jones out of Southern, Southern Utah, Utah as, sure. as a guy kind yeah. of right in that middle group. I think he would probably fit in behind him mm -hmm. in, the, in that category, but still uh, another guy who's a developmental player who, I mean, of course, we've already seen him need a red shirt, but he could still turn into a depth piece. I don't think he's ever going to have starting ca ca caliber players. So mm -hmm. I'd probably still say right around fifth round, six round class. Yeah. I think this is a better tackle class from a depth perspective than last year's. Another guy in this class who I think is very comparable is Kellen Deesh from Arizona State, yeah. who doesn't have the length that you want, but you talk about foot quickness. That that very similar to Ball from last year, and, and Deesh is a, he's a local kid. He's from uh, somewhere in the DFW area. Uh, he's from Byron Nelson Trophy yeah. Club. Right, right, right. Yeah. There's 29 different cities in the DFW yeah, area. Right, I, mean, exactly. I got you. If you can't, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> very astute point for Matt. Uh, he, you know, Good job, Ze Matt. Zeke Elliott's future starts to get murky after the 2022 season. Tony mm -hmm. Pollard is entering a contract year. Mm. With that in mind, uh, he would like some names of maybe some mid to late round running backs, kind of like Tony was back mm -hmm. in 2019, uh, to keep an eye on. This is a pretty good running back class. Um, if you need one of those guys, uh, I don't think we're going to have a first round running back this year. Uh, and then there's a few guys that should go on day two, but the value will be on day three. And uh, it, it depends on, you know, what type of back you're looking for. If you're looking for a guy that can maybe be a bell cow for you, for, you know, a guy that can take those carries, uh, maybe what they envisioned when they drafted a Bo, Bo Scarborough, you know, that, that type of guy. Abram Smith from Baylor. Yes, I, think I he, was hoping <laughs> you would say that I, name. Tremendous season this oh, past year. Yes. Uh, he moved over from linebacker to running back. Um, I think he's he's only his, – his his arrow continues to point up from yep. what he did as a senior to what he did as a senior bowl. Um, I won't be a top tester here, but I think he'll hold his own. So I, I, I think he fits in that mold. I, I agree with you completely. He was a running back in high school, had kind of played mm -hmm. both ways, and then was recruited as a running back. Made the full-time switch to linebacker where he actually was very successful as he a linebacker, was. as a junior. One of the top linebackers in the Big 12 on, of course, that Baylor defense that has been so vaulted over the last couple of years. And then they said, you know what? We like what you could do with the ball in your hands. And then he comes out and just casually puts up 1,600 yards in his only real full-time season as the starting running back. And he had a split backfield to a certain extent with so Tristan Ebner as well. Did he, did he pull the opposite of Jalen Hurd then? Yeah, he technically. Just, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, a little exactly. bit. Those Baylor guys. Yeah. yeah. But he's so he just wanted to get on the field. So he's a bowling ball, uh, man. They talked about moving him to linebacker, and he said, hey, it's, it's going to get me on the field, then I'll do it. And as soon as Dane was talking about, like, eating up carries and, and yeah. that bruiser sort of tailback, he was the first one that comes to mind. Abilene kid. Kyle and I talked about this in Mobile. I was really I, – I, impressed is maybe strong but i i would i liked what i saw from rashad white the arizona state guy yeah. in mobile for as big yeah. as he is i just thought he had he had impressive burst for a bigger running back in my he opinion he does he does I, the key for him will be catching the ball out of the backfield yep. and being that you know that third down guy who you know can do different things for you and move him outside the, the uh, out of the backfield and um i i'll be honest i i don't 
I worry about him as an inside runner. Like I just, I, I'm, I'm not sure that it's he showed enough for me in terms of the the vision and the patience and the tempo to consistently give you that. So I do worry about okay, a defense sees Rashad White out there. They know what's coming. They they know okay, sure, he, flare route, you know, the, the wheel route, that that you know, Texas route. You know, they're gonna they're gonna really that that's, that's what he does best. And so I think he needs to expand what he does really well. I needs to expand that a little bit just so keeps defenses guessing when he's on the field what about Devonte price out of fiu i don't really know exactly how i feel about him because he's again another tall lanky mm -hmm. bigger running back and he's got some burst to it as well looks like he could really kind of play that tony pollard role except he's bigger than tony and a uh, by a couple of inches what do you think about him and his ability out of the backfield could he potentially play a role like that yeah i mean i think he's uh watching him on the fiu tape i don't I don't know that necessarily faced a defense that <laughs> really challenged, challenged him, him, you know, yeah. like could really tell you, uh, you know, just how good he is. Um, I thought for a bigger back, I expected more missed tackles. I just didn't see enough of that for a guy that's that size. But he's got speed. Once he gets in the open field, he can scoop. So um, I, I think he's he's another guy in the day three range where, uh, you know, he, he'd be on the short list of guys he'd be looking at. Cade, and I wonder if this is a coincidence, because of who he wants to know about. Uh, he said Kate Otten yep. <laughs> has reportedly been linked to the Cowboys, which I like it. I mean, I, I take all of that stuff with so many grains of salt in, yeah. at the Combine because everybody— 200 of the 350 players have been linked to the Cowboys to well, a certain extent. And on top of that, I mean, is it a formal interview? Is it informal? an informal? Yeah. Did, they, did they grab him in the hallway and say, hey, we, we think you're a good player? Right, I mean, right, right. there's no way to know, but— he wants to know about Kate Otten, uh, his skill set, mm. tight end out of Washington, for those of y'all that are not familiar. Uh, just sort of thumb, thumbnail him for Cade. I think one of the reasons this Washington coaching staff was fired is because they didn't get the ball enough to Kate Otten. <laughs> Sim simply put. Wow. Uh, the, the offense was anemic this year for the Huskies, and the Kate Otten was their best player, the best player on offense, and they could not get him the football. Uh, part of that was scheme. Part of it was the inability of the quarterback to do it. So uh, that and it just it, 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 he had his foot injury uh, towards the end of the year, and that foot injury kept him out of the Senior Bowl. It's going to keep him from working out here at the combine. Uh, only major injury he's ever had, and unfortunately, it's it's kind of holding him back a little bit. But I think he's a top five tight end in, the, in this class. Uh, he might be the best all around tight end in terms of what he gives you as a receiver and as a blocker. Um, there's just a lot to like about Kate Otten, who he is right now and who he is, as, what he's going to grow into. So because he has that injury, maybe it get him a little bit later than you, than you uh, thought you might. Uh, so if, if a team like the Cowboys want to go tight end in, say, the late third round, man, Kate Otten would be an outstanding pick, in my opinion. Where do you have him compared to Weidemeyer from Texas A&M? Because uh, I, I, I agree with you in terms of they're the most complete uh, I think Otten's more complete, but yeah. Weidemeyer maybe has a higher ceiling. Is there any kind of big difference between those two for you? I think so. I I, I, I like Kate Otten a lot more than like Weidemeyer. Wow. Um, I I mean I shouldn't say that because they uh, Otten's like five on my t tight end rankings. Okay. Weidemeyer six. So uh, you know. They're, oh, okay. They're close, but in my opinion, like Otten, I would feel really good taking on day two. Where with Weidemeyer, I, I don't. I think he's a day three guy, okay. uh, just my opinion. I think the top five tight ends this year are kind of set in my opinion. I think it's uh, not in the, the order I'm still a little, we're trying to figure out. But uh, Trey McBride, mm -hmm. Greg Dulcich, uh, Jeremy Ruckert, Isaiah Likely, Kate Otten. To me, those are the top five tight ends this year. It's just you have to figure out what's the correct order, what's the correct projection in terms of where you should be drafting these guys. They're different with what they offer. Um, but Otten, if you're looking for that, Blake Jarwin, Dalton Schultz. I think Otten fits a lot with what this team could be looking for. Alfredo wants us to put our GM hats on. Mm. He says, what would you, hmm. you, hmm. not anybody else, not the Jacksonville Jaguars, what would you do at number one overall with that Jacksonville pick? Oh. Uh, I'll let you start. That's, well, you know, Aiden Hutchinson's my top player on my, on my board, so I, I'd be disingenuous if I didn't say him. Um, but, you know, the Jaguars have invested a lot in the pass rush position uh, in, in the first mm -hmm. round or, you know, in recent years. So it would be it would come down to Aiden Hudson and Iki Aquanu for me. Uh, Iki's my number two player, my top offensive lineman. I, I think that 
He's uh, really, really good right now, and he's getting better and better. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it would come down to one of those two players. If I wanted to get better uh, pass rusher, wanted to upgrade my offensive line, either Aiden Hutchinson, Ikea Kwanu for me. It's funny because I'm looking at the edge rushers. I think Thibodeau's in that conversation for me as well. I kind of want to know more about him off the field and kind of how the interviews go this week based off of what Dane was talking about yesterday. But just for this exercise, I would throw Thibodeau in that conversation. I, I see my like a, a, a more or a less poor man's Miles Garrett is kind of what I look at with Kayvon Thibodeau. And then I also see Joey Bosa whenever I'm looking at Aiden, Aiden Hutchinson. So I like their potentials there. I like Aquanu for the Jags, though. I'm, mm. I'm honestly with him because I want to protect Trevor Lawrence. I want to find a way to, to really build into the future with him, and I think it starts by building an offensive line up front and maybe trying to find something on the defensive side of the football either later in the draft or through free agency because they have some money to play around there in free agency. Maybe that's where they add veteran talent on the defensive side, but build a young, cheap offensive line with a guy like Aquanu who's going to – Come out and play nasty for you and protect your quarterback at all costs. I hope you got your uh, Iquanu at number one bets in early because uh, uh, you're feeling confident about that. Well, it, I, yeah, no, you can say it. In my, I've only done two mock drafts. <laughs> uh, one was in December. One was um, what January. My my second one, I had Iquanu at number one overall, and an hour after the mock draft went up. His odds to go number one went from like a thousand to one to about twenty five to That's one. It's the kind of so impact Dane Brugler has, Dane Brugler. man. Hope the king is gracious. The king maker. <laughs> I, I mean, unfortunately, I love like I I love questions like that because you want to try to create a difference of opinion and what have would you a do? That's what well, I was about to say. Like, I just think it's kind of it's kind of boring this year because. Mm-hmm. It, it's an edge rusher or a tackle. I don't know who else it could be for a team that just drafted right. Trevor Lawrence. Yep. So I would – and, you know, Dane, I'm such a coward. Like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, it's got to be this guy. But, right. like, I would take Evan Neal or Iquanu, whichever yeah. one you feel better about. Yep. Don't really care what your preference is. Or – Hutchinson or Thibodeau? I would say I would. I feel way more comfortable with Hutchinson just based on what I know right now. I will say – They're both great. Pairing Josh Allen with either one of those guys sounds very, very fun. Sure. But oh, man. How could you do – again, like we talked about yesterday, and there's some irony there because the Bengals didn't draft a tackle and got to the Super Bowl, but why wouldn't you invest in what you do best right now, which is having Trevor Lawrence? Like, keep that guy on That's his feet. Makes that is your sense. clearest path to success. Well, and there's not a Jamar Chase for Jacksonville to That's, draft either. So I, there's, 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 not there's like, a conversation You there. look at – you like, you just look at the, the big names, the sexy names. Any of the corners uh, entice you at all? Oh, your boy Stingley? Mm, if, if, we, if this was February of 2020, I'd be standing well, on the table for it's him. It's fascinating. If you flip his 2019 and 2021 seasons, you just flip them, he goes number one. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think I remember doing the draft show that year and being like, mm-hmm. well, Chalk like, it up. We're, we're sitting here like, done. we're talking about Christian Fulton, and it's like, yeah, but the guy coming down the line's like going to go comes. top five. But yep. I don't I don't feel comfortable with that right now, not That's based fair. on what the last two years have been like. Same thing with, um, again, Thibodeau. There's stuff to figure out there. Um, who else? I mean, all the, there's not a receiver that fits that mold. Kyle Hamilton. When was the last time a receiver even went number one overall? Keyshawn. Yeah, I yeah, think that's six. the last time. And I'm no, yeah. There's not. There's not a guy. No. I, feel, I, mean, I you, just you could make the argument that Kyle Hamilton's the best player in the draft, the best talent yeah. in the draft. And uh, is that I just mean, positional value? Do you have well? Yeah. Do you have the guts to take a safety number one overall? No. I mean, <laughs> I, tell you, no. The, the last safety that went top two overall was uh, back in like 1991 when Belichick drafted Eric Turner out of UCLA. So it and, just doesn't happen well, often. And as long as we're doing the LSU thing, the last safe, like uh, Jamal Adams went top five, and, and that has not really right. panned out the way that yeah. you would prefer That's for why I get anybody. That's con- I get confused when I see <laughs> mock drafts with the Jets taking a safety at four. I was like, oh, they yeah, didn't really. You kind of learned that lesson the already. The position value just doesn't match up with what they That's, like to do. Which, like, yeah. like it's a cliche, but the cornerstone positions. You know, right. Jags don't need a quarterback. There's not a cornerback that I'm sold on doing that, like being worthy of number one mm-hmm. overall. Now you're looking at edge and tackle. There it right. is. And I would rather have a tackle if I just spent a number one overall pick on Trevor Lawrence. <laughs> uh, Mario wants to know, is it is it possible 
for the Cowboys to get wiped out? Like, can you envision that in the scenario? first round? Yeah, at 24. I'd be surprised just because I think, you know, like the difference between pick 15 and 50, there's just not that much difference. And so you're telling me that they can't find a player that they like in that range that they would feel feel good about there? Now, obviously, you have your wish list. You have who you really want. And could they get wiped out of their top options? Sure, I think that's that's possible. You know, Linderbaum's gone. All the pass rushers are gone. Um, you know, say Kenyon Green's gone. Um I think it, that is semi-realistic, but there, I think there's going to be someone that they're going to feel comfortable with um, at that point in the draft, and you know they're they're going to get and, and you know what, what what draft was it was it 2013 when they drafted Travis Frederick yeah and they kind of you know that that whole you know weren't sure what they were going to go and they traded back and they still you know obviously it worked out okay um, <laughs> I, I think with this this group they're they're going to find someone they like there I, I would be very surprised if they couldn't find a player that they didn't think very highly of. Um, at that point in the draft. No, I think I'm with you. Because even when you look at it and we talk through the 10 names that we feel like are there, if you wanted to stretch that to 15 that are locks to go in front of 24, I still see 10 uh, 10 other names. So Mm -hmm. even with the 15 guys that you think are going to be out of your reach, there's another 10, 15 guys that you still feel great about taking at 24. And it's different for every conversation you have. Some people will like the fact that Zion – Zion Johnson Johnson could potentially be there at 24. Others might not like it. But depending on what this coaching staff does, there's going to be people in the room pounding on the table for somebody that's at 24 because they like those prospects. I'm not falling for this banana in the tailpipe in 2022 because we stress out about it every year. And more often than not, it works out pretty well. I mean, ironically, they got wiped away from their cornerbacks last year. Yeah. So, I mean, that did happen. But but those were elite quarterback yeah. corners, and, and they, they still had two names I was going to say, over. they still wound up with a choice of two guys that were named all pros as rookies. Worked out yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it worked out all right. Uh, one last one from our buddy Connor, friend of the show. Woo. Sam Williams, Ole Miss, mm. edge rusher. Uh, he want, he's got some off-the-field issues. Kind of talk about who he is as a prospect and where would he be without, like, how how highly would you rate him without the off-field and and how will that affect his draft stock? Yeah, we talk about context and how important it is with these guys, understanding where they're from. And uh, he he was a basketball guy growing up. That was his focus. Um, And he goes to high school um, and is a football player. Uh, You know, got into some some trouble in high school, had to transfer a senior year. Um, has to go the JUCO route because he's not, he, you know, doesn't have the grades uh, for football. Didn't have the, the pedigree either, really, uh, just as a relatively new uh, football player. He was, again, always a basketball player most of his life. Goes the JUCO route, does really, really well. Then goes to Ole Miss, uh, ran into some trouble there, but he was cleared to stay on the field. And uh, this past year, he was really productive, uh, all SEC player. Uh, there, there's a little bit of stiffness in his rush, but he's got acceleration. Uh, he can make plays versus the run. Uh, as long if you're comfortable with the person, you're comfortable with his background and, and everything that went on behind the scenes, uh, you're going to feel comfortable uh, drafting this guy somewhere on day two. And I think you're going to get a, a, a pass rusher that you're going to make as part of your rotation right away, and then uh, a, a guy that eventually you think uh, can start for you down the road. He was added to the Senior Bowl week late, right? He was. He was at NFLPA, Collegiate Bowl. That's and right. And injuries, he got added late to uh, to the roster for the Senior Bowl, yeah. Had a pretty good week, too, would just you, on yeah, the field. He did. Would you imagine, and I, I mean, it, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Like, yeah. you can't predict right. what all 32 teams are going to think. But would you guess that, that his, his, his past is enough to push him into day three? Probably just because, um, you know, uh, it, it was something that he was cleared pretty quickly. But still, as, you know, more teams dig. And, you know, he had an incident in high school that involved a knife, like a pocket knife. And, and you know, that he got kicked out of school for that. Um, I, I think that it's it's possible, very possible, that he's still around in fourth, fifth round. But um, I, I still think there's a good chance there will be at least one team that is – you know, is okay with everything and just wants to buy low on the the pass rush potential. Wonderful batch of questions. We appreciate it. We will be right back after this break to wrap up this Wednesday show. Be right back. Football season is almost over, and that means tax season is here. With it comes taxiety. 
Filing taxes can be stressful if you choose the wrong partner. Don't let Taxiety take over this tax season. Liberty Tax will help you get your largest possible refund or your money back. With more than 12,000 tax professionals nationwide, help is always around the corner. Check out Liberty Tax, proud partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Schedule an appointment today at libertytax.com slash cowboys. Liberty Tax, a brighter way to do taxes. Hey, Cowboys fans, if you're thinking about attending a game this season, visit cowboystravel.com to book your travel package today. Stay at the team hotel, have dinner with a Cowboys legend, and experience AT&T Stadium's exclusive VIP owners club also tour the star get autographs from your favorite players and talk x's and o's with me mickey spagnola the official travel partner of the dallas cowboys will take care of all your travel needs visit cowboystravel.com what do you call a group of grown men and women with their faces painted silver and blue who get together every week to share a three-hour long ritual of jumping sinking and toasting miller light and 10 gallon hats while yelling how about them cowboys You call it Miller Time in Dallas. Here's to the Cowboys. Here's to the original light beer. It's Miller Time. Celebrate responsibly. 2021 Miller Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. This is Chad Hennings, former cowboy and proud veteran of the United States Air Force. When my fellow military veterans choose VA, they receive life-changing benefits from the Department of Veterans Affairs. If you are a veteran, you may be eligible for health care, education, and training benefits, a home loan guarantee, housing assistance, and more. Choose VA for the benefits you've earned. Visit choose.va.gov to learn more. That's choose.va.gov. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Wrapping up Wednesday's episode of the Draft Show, I'm Dave Hellman, joined by Kyle Yeomans and Dane Brugler of The Athletic. We will have one more show for y'all on Thursday, which, ironically, well, I mean, I'm nothing if not transparent. We still won't have seen any damn drills by tomorrow. It afternoon. may be going on while we record. Yeah, actually, there are, there are some drills that There's start There's a potential early. for another guest there, too. Oh, ooh, Kyle! Can you tell? Can you tell Kyle's hosted things in the past? <laughs> I, I've I've learned from the talent coaches that tease is a powerful thing. I have heard whispers on the wind that sprinkles. Cowboys executive vice president of personnel Will McClay might be joining us bum, for bum, a segment. Bum. I'm excited about that. I Will, think it's gonna be great. Will is always very good with his time after the draft. Mm. If he actually sits down with us during Combine Week and gives us a segment, that would be pretty amazing. Heck yeah, well. I think it would be great. And, by the way, it should be up by the time this is posted, but we got a chance to sit down with Stephen Jones and talk we about did. a couple things about Talked Combine, Combine Week as well. So. I, try, like, I, I try to keep the Cowboys weeds off of this show. Because but that was a draft interview, no, no, though. For sure, for sure. Yeah. We got into, into some prospect talk, into some drill talk. So that will be on the site yeah, depending on when you're listening to this, it's probably already there. Yeah, it probably is. So, but yeah, keep tuned for that. In the meantime, Kyle, you speaking of teased, <laughs> you teased this in the first segment. Not on purpose, but I did. Why on earth would you want to trade up in this draft? Hmm. Well, because of kind of what we were talking about earlier. If you're telling me that you can get up nine spots in the draft, I'm looking at 13. I know that's 11. That is a massive jump. That is a big jump. If you can tell me you can maybe move in front of the Eagles, either at their 19th pick, you can get in front of them. (laughs) Yeah, if you can get in front of them at 19 or you can get in front of them at 15 and ensure that you get your top prospect on the board, depending on how much they like them. I like Tyler Linderbaum enough to go and do that. I don't know if they do. That's the thing. Is the Cowboys, are they willing to do that? I also don't want to give up 56 in order to do that. Mm-hmm. I don't want to give up that second-round pick. I told you two weeks ago, don't give me that look. You're going to jump nine spots in the first round and hold on to your second-round pick? That's tough. Maybe if it's that cheap, then, yeah, let's talk about it. I don't think the nine would happen. I think it would be 11, not 11, excuse me, 17, 18, maybe in there somewhere if you wanted to trade with New Orleans, if they wanted to trade back and maybe get a better – view of the land for a quarterback 17 maybe the chargers don't necessarily want to make their pick there they want to trade back a little bit more i don't usually feel comfortable speaking for dane but i just dane he's looking at me give me the pick stain right what is it gonna take it would have to be one of like my top six players one of those guys would have to fall you know and 
for me to have to make that type of move. Yeah, I'm not making that move for Linderbaum. I'm not making that move for... Do I have to give up 56 in order to make it happen? I If you're talking about... If you're going nine spots. Nine, ten, eleven spots, yeah. I, yeah, yeah I see, so. I don't want to do that then. Especially, I'm okay with that. The chart... The chart kind of goes out the window in the first round a little bit. I mean, right. you can still, especially it's based on the prospect right. pool. You can exactly like. Yeah. I mean, you you dictate the terms yeah. when you're talking about the first round. That's like those trades get out of whack all Giants the time. Giants and Bears last year, whenever they were at 11 behind the Cowboys, to go to go up and get Justin Fields. That right. was a massive number. It's not going to take that massive number to go up seven spots, eight spots again this year because there's not that high quarterback pool that you have to pull from as long as we're doing this and dane i would love your input i mean i'll, I'll be honest we've, we've talked about tyler linderbaum mm. a lot and we will keep doing it yeah, and that's gonna happen that's fine but i f i feel myself coming around on this thought process like i almost feel like we're making a bigger deal of tyler biotish than we need to because like i look yeah. i look at it tyler biotish Fourth round pick. He's he's been fine. He mm -hmm. definitely he's got some stuff to work on. Yeah. Definitely, the interior of this offensive line was a weak point. Sure. Was he so bad that that should be like the Where's Waldo situation? Especially when you consider left guard was equally a problem. And oh by the way, they don't really have one right now. Okay. Connor Williams is a free agent. Connor McGovern replaced him in the lineup and quickly got yanked again. Doesn't inspire a ton of confidence in me. And so, like, when I'm thinking about these names that you fixate on in the first round, I start to lean toward uh, Kenyon Green as a more intriguing option. Okay. Because if you play Tyler Biotish between the best guard in football and a first-round pick, he might look a hell of a lot better. That's, that's fair. Absolutely. And, and I, me personally, I'd rather go after – say a Luke Fortner in the third round and have him compete for that job. Fortner's going to give you center guard versatility. He's going to help you upgrade the offensive line. Uh, but I think your your point is valid where you upgrade one, that other guard spot and all of a sudden Tyler Biotish, uh, you know, all of a sudden his play goes up as well, his performance. So that's, that's very fair. Um, I think it's fair to look at this and say, okay, well, let's look at last year. The first how many picks for the Cowboys were defensive? Five or yep. six, I believe. That's rare you know? uh, <laughs> unprecedented right this year I, it could be the opposite it really could be we could see the first five picks for the cowboys being offensive this is going to be an offensive heavy draft and offensive line tight end probably receiver those three positions it's it's going to be you know make up three of the first probably four picks the cowboys make in my opinion so let me get this straight so you're not saying go away from offensive line in the first you're Not saying all. potentially pull Kenyon green up to the tyler linderbaum sort of scenario there yeah and i, I want to be if if tyler linderbaum was their pick i would be happy with that sure no problem at all i just again we've got four months of airtime to fill and only so much we can say and i just kind of i get the sense that like people, he's the default people become fixated on him to the point where i'm like well hang on now like there are other ways we yeah. can improve this without just f obsessing over improving a center where you have a young starter who's not been great but also not been awful like, and i think mm -hmm. you you bring up great points because right now you look at the contract situation biotish is on the team your starter at left guard is not on the team at the moment. I would assume and that's Connor not. Williams. I mean, you, would you rather would you rather go like, you know, training camp is wrapping up in early September, late August. Mm -hmm. Would you rather Tyler Biotish as your starting center or Connor McGovern as your starting left guard? What would you prefer? I think I would probably still go with Tyler Biotish as the starting center. I agree. I, I agree. The the only thing that throws a wrench into that conversation is if they're willing to move Lyle Collins to left guard. But yeah. we're getting the the thought process that that's not going to happen. We, we kind of regardless. We get the inkling here from getting to you know Just, the beauty of the combine. We yeah, have to go out and talk get to, to talk. People. You, I, I don't get the feeling that that is in the cards. Do I don't you? think so either. And if that's not in the cards, then I think I'm more on board with the green pick than a Linderbaum pick. I mean, not more so. But I think both are great players, and they're right there with each other. But I would be more enticed by the green pick or trying to upgrade that guard spot rather. Because either way, you're looking at it as a quarterback behind it in that interior pressure that was an absolute problem on the back half of the schedule this season. And he, of course, had the shoulder, he had the calf, he had the ankle, he's had all these injuries. you got to protect Dak Prescott. 
And in order to do that, you're going to have to upgrade one of those two positions early in this draft before really you even look at some other spots. Dan, you're so intuitive because, again, we get we get to come out here and we talk to people. Somebody was joking with us yesterday. We're like, yeah, talk talk up how we need defenders. Talk up how we're going defense heavy again. Right? <laughs> Don't let anybody like, – let's not, <laughs> let's not put it out there that we're hunting <laughs> offense, which – Maybe that's maybe it's extreme to say they're hunting offense, but I when you think about the potential issues at receiver, not even potential. Yep. No, no matter what happens with Amari Cooper, they got holes to fill there. Tight end is a problem spot for this team. Interior offensive line, and then even down the line, you can throw running back in there as well. well edge rusher and wide receiver are not out of the question in the first two rounds either. I for mean, sure. it's one hundred percent a chance. This team wants to be explosive on offense, and you know we saw flashes of that throughout the season, but. In order to be more consistently explosive, they have work to do. And it starts at, on the offensive line, starts with, uh, uh, you know, p targets on the outside. Um, it, there's there's a different directions they could go. Tight end's going to look different. The, the tight end depth chart's going to look very different next year. So uh, this is a tight end draft where I would feel very comfortable waiting until the fourth round to draft one. Uh, I mean, that, that's kind of what they did with Dalton Schultz. Uh, you're kind of, you know, maybe go that direction again with uh, uh, targeting one of these guys in the fourth round, feeling good about who you're getting at that point. So, yeah, this is a, this is going to be an offensive-heavy draft, I think, for the Cowboys. Real quick before we get out of here, Jeff Kavanaugh is not here to do it, so I'll speak for him. Yeah. But can you sell me on a trade down? Like, how attractive does that <laughs> how attractive does that look to you, given this talent pool? Yeah, and I think, obviously, it's tough when you're talking about picking 24. You don't know how the first 23 picks go. You don't know who's on the board for you. Um, but if someone's offering you, say, uh, a package of day two picks, that that's awfully appealing. But it, it's going to sting a little bit to move out of the first round if that's what uh, if a team's moving up to get a quarterback or um, you know I, I think I I would love to trade back a few spots and still stay in the first round still have my first round pick mm -hmm. and then pick up an extra day two pick to me that would be an ideal scenario because again I don't think you're getting wiped out there at 24. I just want I I just want day two picks like, that's, yeah, that's all I want that sounds fun you stack you, them up you sell like a GM. picks I mean I. I yeah, I, I don't know about mm. it. We'll, we'll finish it with where we started it. Yeah, Laquan Treadwell, I don't know. I don't know if I actually, <laughs> I don't know if I actually want to be making those decisions. Hey, you weren't the only it. one. That'll do it for day two of the draft show. We got one more, hopefully joined by Will McClay. We'll see about that. We will check in with you all tomorrow. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!